Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Dogma Disrupted. Palestine is reeling once again. Today has been a bloody day for the people of Gaza. Uh, over 1,500 people have been killed, many of them children. Um, and we are in a moment that feels like a familiar moment, where Muslims are uh, not even allowed to feel their pain with all of the media and how everything is being covered. Um, so to help unpack what this means for us and to help navigate uh, the issues that are unfolding as they're unfolding very, very quickly. We've got two very special guests with us today, uh, Dr. Omar Suleiman and Dr. Weimer Enjem. Welcome both of you to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a little bit of background. Um, what's been going on recently? Um, what's the situation currently? Inshallah, Tana, I'll start. Um, you know, over the past um, few weeks in particular, the agitation, the incursions on Al Aqsa, the settler violence, and all of that has been really increased, right? And then obviously, um, you know, things exploded um, a few days ago with the attack that came from Gaza, um, you know, on the border uh, of Gaza. And um, you know the, the the southern area of of Israel, and as we start to see the occupation increasing and the agitation increasing and the um, catastrophe unfolding before our eyes, I think one of the things that we've noted this time um, is that there is a finality that is sought. There is an open check that's been given to genocide. Uh, Gaza is encountering a catalog of war crimes that um, seems to mean absolutely nothing to the powers that be. And you essentially have a population, and the Palestinian people, obviously, Palestine um, is all occupied, but Gaza, I think many people forget, is 60% refugees. You know, I have family in Gaza, they didn't start out in Gaza. 60% uh, refugees that fled from other territories that were occupied by Israel. Uh, from the Palestinians. And this open air prison has been basically an experimental laboratory where the most sophisticated weapons in the world are being used against the most desperate population in the world. Uh, whether you speak in terms of population density or you speak in terms of infrastructure, there is no place in the world like Gaza. And for them to now be shut off from all directions, to have their water supply shut off, to have their power shut off, to have their fuel shut off, and to uh, be bombed from every direction. There is absolutely no schism uh, that is recognizable to the people of what the pattern of these bombings are. Um, you're guessing every night whether you should try to spend the night in your home or you should try to go next door to your family's home, uh, cousin's home, or whatever it is. Um, because you can't figure out where the bombing is going to be next. And now we have proof of the use of chemical weapons. So Human Rights Watch released just a few hours ago that Israel has been using white phosphorus. Uh, and if any of you have ever seen children after a white phosphorus attack, it is absolutely horrific. The long-term consequences, we know that it was used uh, against the people of Syria. Uh, and this is not the first time it's been used against the people of Gaza, but to have it confirmed at this point and to still not have a word being spoken by the American administration or a word about Palestinian suffering in mainstream media has been particularly outrageous. And I think that as we are witnessing this you know, unfold before our eyes, um, there's a sense of betrayal that I think the Muslim community is feeling and that you know, Palestinians are feeling in particular because people are parroting um, you know, the worst types of tropes about Muslims and the quote-unquote Arab savages uh, that we've seen since 9-11. And the framing has been atrocious, the erasure of the Palestinian voice, the erasure of Palestinian humanity. And you're seeing it from, you know, your friends on social media, you're seeing it from your boss at work, you're seeing it from your company statements, you're seeing it in the NFL statement, you're seeing it in the NBA statement. So it's hitting you from every direction right now. And I think that um, it's that much more important than for us, those of us that have a voice, and that means everybody on here, to use that voice to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sincere du'a 
and to use that voice with whatever platform that you have and whatever position that you have to uplift the Palestinian voice that is being rapidly silenced. One of the things that um, that your comments reminds me of to highlight is that the status quo is so violent that this is something that, you know, part of the framing and the deception, the framing is that this just happened out of nowhere. This happened on October 7th or started on October 7th, that this just um, is some uh, attack or offensive or you can't divorce it from the larger context of what has what has been going on. Um, you know, um, that the everyday existence of Palestinians in general and people in Gaza specifically is so violent. And that violence is at every single turning point and every single opportunity erased. Um, that to see all of this outpouring of sentiment, it's disgusting and it's a slap in the face. And that's not to say that we don't have sympathy for victims. Obviously, there's a certain common denominator of human life, you know, that is sacred and we, we respect. But the, how tone deaf it is and how completely oblivious it is to the larger context, um, it, it's, it's quite maddening. It's quite maddening. I, I want to say, Mount Tom, on that, like on that point, it's really interesting that human rights languaging and, and, and framing is used to beat up on the Muslim community globally and domestically constantly. But suddenly, when that human rights framework of apartheid and the legal threshold of apartheid being reached or structural violence and freedom of movement and all of these other things that uh, institute uh, massive acts of crimes against humanity and violence against the people uh, are ignored when it's no longer uh, you know, uh, potent against the Muslim community, but instead it's against our oppressors. So it, it is absolutely enraging and infuriating. It's hard to take the West seriously on the values it purports to um, to symbolize and advance. And we've had one of the things that uh, I know Paul Williams has highlighted, language that was just a year ago used to talk about Russia and how to cut off electricity and to cut off food and to cut off medical supplies constitutes war crimes. When it applies to Russia, it seems like that's a recognized fact. But then if someone does it against a Muslim or against a Palestinian, then all of a sudden it not only becomes okay, but it becomes justified as necessary violence to keep the brutes, the savages, the terrorists, whatever, however they're being um, you know, framed and maligned uh, at the moment in order to keep them in line uh, on their own land, on, in their own homes. Um, so that brings us to a point that I think is really, really essential, which is talking about media literacy in general, right? I think that, um, you know, uh, th things have seemed to shifted. I think a lot of people do understand that there are strong biases in the media, especially younger people who are more on social media than traditional news outlets. But, um, you know, there's a long, long history. And I know Dr. Wehmer and I were talking about this off camera. There's a long, long history to the, um, the media machine and drumming up, you know, hitting the war drums, right? Beating the war drums. And, and this goes back quite far. So maybe Dr. Weimer, you can, you can give us a little bit of a, of a sense or a context. How much can we trust coming from the media in the first place? We complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't complain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's first of all, the way of a believer. And this truth is something that you find in Gaza and in Palestine. You see the courage and faith in Gaza and the entire Ummah is put to shame. So even though it hurts my heart to hear, to see, and this is not new, this is 75 years of oppression and state terrorism, 75 years of humiliation and betrayal. But the more I have, as I've grown up thinking about this problem, I have learned that Philistine is the beating heart of the Ummah. It is what keeps us as an Ummah together. And it breaks my heart that our people in Palestine, I don't like to say Palestinians are Philistine. They're our people. They happen to be in Palestine. Their houses were taken. Their lives were destroyed. 
And they're not the only ones. There are people in Kashmir and people, the Uyghur and the Rohingya and more and more people. But our people who are in Palestine, they are guarding our sanctities. They are guarding our holiest shrine. They are guarding the first Qibla. They are guarding the place that is the most praised, most frequently praised in the Quran. And so when they show their courage, you know, despite all of that, when I talk to people from Gaza or hear from people uh, of Gaza, and especially Gaza, of course, but all of Palestine, my iman increases. My not only iman, my knowledge of my faith increases. I see miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala centered in the Quran a land that he knew subhanahu wa ta'ala 1400 years ago that will always remain the center. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa spoke of Ta'ifa Mansura, uh, a group that will be given aid by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forever. And in some narrations, that is Asham, Syria, that is Bayt al Maqdis and what is around it. And that's a miracle. The Prophet, وسلم, it is as if he is looking at what is happening now and he is giving us instruction. This is the Ta'ifa Mansura. This is where you're going to find faith. If you want to understand Islam, this is you're going to, how you're going to begin to understand Islam. And when I look at the Quran, and this is what uh, Sheikh Omar and I wrote in, in the article that was published uh, a couple of years ago on Philistine. Uh, um, if you look at the Ghazwat of Badr, if you look at how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was rahmatan lil alameen, when he took up arms, if you look at his reasons that are given in the Quran, those reasons apply 100% to the people of Palestine today. It is as if Allah has kept Badr alive among us so that whenever we pick up the Quran and we want to know what is the Quran talking about, you have an example. This is what it means. Why? Because if you think about, you know, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about Badr? يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ قُلْ كِتَابٍ فِيهِ كَبِيرٍ وَصَدٌ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ this was the justification of why ultimately later Badr took place. This is why Rasulullah was sending um, expeditions to cut off caravans. But the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above heaven, seven heavens, justifies and gives reason to why Rasulullah and the poor Muslims were doing so, what Allah says is that they ask you about the violation which had occurred, which is the context of the ayah of Shahr al-Haram. And they say, this is bad. Allah says, yes, but what you are doing, you're obstructing the path of Allah. You're obstructing, you're expelling people from the sacred mosque, preventing people from visiting us, visiting it, and then ikhraj ahlihi minhu, expelling people from their homes. And subhanAllah, you find that this motif of expelling people from their homes that appears again and again in the Quran, as it is as if it is one of the greatest sins that humans commit against each other and against the people of faith, right? And what's interesting is that all of these four things are found in Ahl Palestine today, in the uh, struggle of uh, our brothers and sisters, our people in Palestine. So to me, hard and heartbreaking and heart-wrenching as it is, they're also holding up this, this symbol of Islam. They're holding up the courage of Islam. They're showing us, the rest of the Ummah, you know, subhanAllah, when the British and the, the French came and uh, cut up the Muslim Ummah into secular territorial nation states with the intention of destroying us, Philistine, they left hurting. 
And it is for that reason that we cannot forget what they have done to us. It is as if they're, they, ha- they left an open wound that reminds us every day of what we can be and what we were and what we must be in order to gain our, uh, the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. So I see this irony, you know, on the one hand, it is one of the most heartbreaking places. But on the other hand, Palestine is the only place in the Muslim world where you see faith beginning, where you see light, where you see courage, courage that stares down these uh, monsters uh, who, who fabricate lies after lies, right? Now I'll, I'll get to the question you asked of misinformation and disinformation. Vietnam was a lie. We know that now as historians. The, in fact, the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was based on a false premise. The Japanese wanted to uh, surrender. We now know that because of uh, declassification of, of documents. The first Gulf War was a lie. Children were being taken from incubators and being killed, and that's why we needed to go. Americans, right, needed to go and, and, and kill Iraqis. Second Gulf War was a lie. There were no weapons of mass destruction. What was happening in Afghanistan was a lie. Despite all of that, right, we are used to, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, when, when a wicked person comes to you, You do not believe what they are saying. You have to investigate. You have to take that in your own hands. What if this wicked person, this wicked institution has lied to you and to the rest of the poor and the oppressed in the world for a century? And then now it tells you that uh, 40 babies were spearheaded. And the president gets up and says he saw the videos of 40 babies being beheaded. Imagine the level of fabrication and lying when a president of a country puts his credibility on the line for the false propaganda from the tabloids that he's getting. Imagine the level of lying. Imagine the level of wickedness. Right? But we are being told that you have to believe this and forget the 75 years of international community. Again and again, hundreds of United Nations resolutions that are ineffective, all vetoed. You have to over, uh, overlook all of that in order to believe the new lies that we are being told. But I see them not through through the eye of rage, even though it is outrageous, but I see that as a sign of faith, as a truth, because these same tactics were being used against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, who loves his Prophet more than anything else and anyone else, and honored his Prophet and allowed his Prophet to suffer, then we have to say that people of Philistine who are uh, and the people of Gaza who have to put up with these lies, but they through this they are being honored by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They are so uh, I pray for them. I find them to be a treasure trove of instruction, of inspiration, and lessons. You know, when I read the Quran, I want to know where is this happening? Where is this struggle? And I find that in Pete Philistine and the people of Philistine. Beautiful words, Dr. Oemir. I, I think there's, uh, just to add to some of the context that you were providing when it comes to um, the reasons to not believe the outlandish claims of the media and the outlandish framing of the media, in addition to its track record, 
right? And the conflict of interest that is fundamental to the war machine and the military industrial complex and the lobbyists and everything that's going on, we have a record of dehumanization of, of Palestinians and Muslims in the area, right? I mean, literally on record, we have Netanyahu, we have other people um, saying right from their mouths, like video evidence, audio evidence that they're going to do this and that, and this is their tactic. We have it you know, very clear evidence that they you know, refer to killing Palestinians as mowing the lawn, right? We have um, and animals and animals. Yes, we have yeah, just the other day one of the one of the ministers calling it. We're fighting human animals. Like this is all on record and all for they admit it. They admit it. There's no there's no doctored evidence. There's no sort of uh, deep fakes videos or or photoshopped images. This is something that they freely admit. And so how would you possibly trust the word that comes out of these people's mouths when it comes to the scope of things, when it comes to the order of things, the magnitude of things, what's going on? At the very least, everybody has to be cautious and take everything with 17 tablespoons of salt, not just a grain of salt, a whole salt shaker, right? And, and be vigilant and understand that it's all about how you're framing things. Even the Israeli pets are granted more humanity and mercy and care than the Palestinian human beings that are living in their own homes and getting uh, bombed and starved. Yeah. Imam Tan, I want you to, you know, uh, Dr. Wayman may Allah reward you for those words, uh, very powerful words. Um, you know, they're talking about our grandparents. They're talking about our parents. They're talking about our brothers and sisters. They're talking about, you know, I think there's an imam in the United States, and I want you to think about the compounded cruelty of this. There's an imam that we know in the United States who lost 15 members of his family in one night. But he does not, he, he does not want to go public yet because of the repercussions to him and his immigration status or whatever it may be, things coming against him. Like think about the compounded cruelty of this machine of propaganda playing on the tropes of Arab savages, Muslim savages, beheading babies and, you know, uh, rape and all types of things. Let's agree that the killing of children is evil. Let's agree that rape is evil. Okay, why are you turning a blind eye to Palestinian children being pulled out of the rubble in pieces? Why are you turning a blind eye to all of the standards that you just iterated a few months ago? You know, it was interesting. You're talking about the double standards of Russia. I was looking at this tweet by... Uh, Ursula uh, von der Leyen, who is, of course, the president of the EU. And uh, this is from October 19th, 2022. We're literally just a year removed. And she says, Russia's attacks against civilian infrastructure, especially electricity, are war crimes, cutting off men, women, children of water, electricity, and heating with winter coming. These are acts of pure terror, and we have to call it as such. If you just literally replace Russia with Israel, you will be branded an anti-Semite and you will be shut out of your company, possibly lose your job, possibly be kicked out of your, your university. You will be attacked, you know, by, by all sorts of shady Zionist watch lists. You will be called all sorts of names. And so the double standards are not coming out of nowhere. I mean, it is clearly building upon a fabrication of Islam a fabrication of the Muslim that set the pretext for the murder of hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, like Dr. Weimer said. American propaganda is Israeli propaganda. Israeli propaganda is American propaganda. This is exactly how the process of dehumanization works. That's why you can't name a single victim of the Iraq war if you're in the United States, because those sto stories have been kept far away from you. And so when people try to put you, and I'm, I'm saying this especially to the viewers here, because you're getting pressure from your friend circles, you're getting pressure from your local media. When people try to put you on the back foot, do not let them, do not let them make you forget the past 75 years or the current days in which their hypocrisy is showing itself clearer and clearer and clearer every single day. You know, these reductionist talking points that remove us from an entire history of colonialism and occupation and apartheid. And to what Dr. Weimer said about the, you know, subhanAllah, the, the present inspiration, the example, the people of Palestine refuse to go away. 
They refuse to go away. They are the most resilient people. Our brothers and sisters in Palestine, the most resilient people on earth, the people of Gaza in particular, they are the most resilient people on earth. These people dare to go to Fajr in the rubble. You can still see them calling the Adhan on a masjid that was destroyed last night. Imagine going to Fajr and you woke up and all nine of your family members are dead. And you still walk to Salat al-Fajr. These people, as once this is all over, inshallah ta'ala soon, and we hope for a complete removal of the blockade and freedom from occupation. But if it were to return the way that it usually does after these, these massacres take place, you know what they're going to do? They're still going to get married. They're still going to have their weddings. They're still going to have their aqiqas. They're still going to uh, pursue their education. They're still going to memorize the Quran. They still find a way to live. What type of a people can deal with that trauma and still move forward? They are a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are special people. Yeah. These, you know, I, I was looking at the video of, and it's been, it's been really hard to watch these videos, but like I said, it's, it's harder to be in these videos than to watch these videos, right? I mean, imagine the people that are living this day and night, you know, the father and the son, <clears throat> just this video today, a father and a son that are in the stretchers next to each other. And the son with whatever chemicals or whatever, what, whatever, has been done to his face is comforting his father, telling his father, you know, uh, don't don't worry, you know, th- don't cry. We're gonna we're gonna make it through this, Baba. Don't cry anymore. And I thought to myself, Subhanallah, what a people, what a people. It's an honor, Wallahi, to be to to be on their side. We pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gather us with them, because if the majority of the people of Jannah are Mustadhafin and Fuqara, imagine these people and their rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's an honor for us it's to, to, to actually be their advocates uh, in, in, in the belly of the beast, so to speak, even while we're being suffocated by the propaganda at every political and social level. That's a great point. And it, I think that's something on a lot of people's minds, how to respond. Like you mentioned the fact we are always forced to assume the position of condemnation and denunciation. And that is a deliberate tactic to keep us from pointing out the brutality and the inhumanity of the occupation. Um, I'm sure everybody across uh, North America or in other places, especially, you know, places in, in Europe might even have it more difficult with less freedom to say what needs to be said. How, if you're, if you're someone who is put in a position to explain it to your coworker, explain it to your boss, or explain it to your professor, or explain it to, um, you know, even local news, how should this thing be framed? What should, how should people, um, how should people talk about it? What's the language that we should use? What's the language that we're forced to use that, that actually is a cage? Dr. Wynn. Yeah, you know, subhanAllah, what I find is that um, if we are willing to talk, which is a hard thing to do, because there's this barrage of propaganda and assumptions and our own fears. But if you are willing to talk, talking about Palestine is the easiest thing in the world to do. Give an example, like you're living in your house, somebody else comes and shows you a mythology, a document right? A fake document that nobody in the world today accepts, right? If you go to the city, nobody accepts that, you know, this document that you made up that, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago, somebody promised you this land. You say, okay, get out of here, right? You can call the police on them. That would be the end of it. But that's not the world we live in. We live this, when this happened, we lived in a world colonized where there were deliberate and um, genocides being committed by the British and the French empires, French in Algeria and elsewhere, right? The British in India, uh, in South Asia and the Middle East, uh, the Belgians in Congo. I mean, just this was the world in which uh, the Jews were on the receiving end of this. For nearly 2,000 years, Jews experienced European hospitality, right? And our heart goes out to that. This was persecution. And outside of the Islamic world, the Jews did not find thriving and flourishing and prosperity anywhere else. 
That was the only place. So now, when Europe dumps its own sins, its own guilt, and its own hatred, it wasn't just guilt, it was also an attempt to just get rid of the Jews, because anti-Semitism was still quite rampant, as it is until today uh, in Europe. So Balfour Declaration, if you look at the politics around it, there is anti-Semitism. It's just to get rid of the Jews. And also the assumption that the Jews are pulling the strings in Russia, which was the reason Balfour Declaration was passed. Give them this piece of land. A land without people for people without land. That was That's the fiction. Today, if I tell an eight, eighth grader, ninth grader, that this is what was said, they'd be like, that's insane, right? They'd say, so this is not much of an argument. You don't have to say, if somebody comes to your home and then, and says, you know, get out of here, I'm going to put you in a barn and in the garage, and you cannot go to the bathroom. If I kill your baby, you got to sit and watch that. And make sure you, my generation, will oppress your generation. My children, my next generation, will oppress your children. My grandchildren will make sure that the lives of your grandchildren are like hell. That's the deal that's been given to Palestinians. And you ask anybody in the world, Especially ask the people who, before starting their meetings, they say, oh, we are, we're standing in stolen land, land in Canada, in the United States. Really? You feel guilty about that? Right? You are land acknowledgments now, right? Land acknowledgments. I mean, so 200 years from now, this is what they want to do, but they will not. Yeah. I swear to Allah, they will not. It will be a very different story. But this is what they want to do to Palestinians. They want 200 years from now to say, yes, we came and we massacred and we murdered. We terrorized generations after generations. Right? We're sorry about that, but we are standing on that land. That's what they want to say. But they will not say that. I can guarantee Sure as anything. Mom, Tom, I would just add to to that. Um, you know, Dr. Weimer is, is is talking about sort of the legacy of colonialism, and you can't talk about this ethno fascist state and and the ideology of Zionism without knowing anything about colonialism, right? But I think to even pull into pull from the more recent history too, sort of build build on. You know, the fact that first and foremost, when you're talking to your colleagues, look, you really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're being fed some very reductionist points mm -hmm. and a very, very skewed narrative. One of the things that the Quran and the Sunnah do frequently um, is the Prophet Sallallahu tells you to put yourself in the place of someone else. That's very effective prophetic communication, right? Would you like this for yourself? Right? And so when I tell the story of my own parents, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, my parents were born in Palestine. My dad always makes the joke, may Allah subhanahu wa preserve him. And my dad's like, I'm five years older than Israel. I was born in 1943, and no one's going to tell me I was born in Israel. <laughs> right? I was born in Palestine. Uh, I'm older than the state of Israel. My parents met in Houston. I've never been allowed back into Palestine. I find out from... Uh, you know, distant relatives that, hey, you know, settlers just walked into this new piece of your land because I actually have land assigned to me somewhere in the West Bank right now, right? That's in my name that I can't access. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, they just cut out this much. By the way, the wall just cut into this part of the land. And some folks from Long Island, right, are now living there. How ironic on the basis of what? So the, th the land theft, structural violence, and apartheid. Apartheid is a word. There is there's a reason why that word is so, you know, vehemently rejected by Western powers, because 
America stood against the freedom fighters of South Africa. America was the last leg of apartheid against the South Africans, and it's doing the same thing to the Palestinians. You know, I was, I was looking at, um, so I was, I was showing you this, this book, old book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, by Jimmy Carter, uh, who was, of course, a U.S. president. And this book was written in 2006. So just read this paragraph. A system of apartheid with two peoples occupying the same land but completely separated from each other with Israelis today, totally dominant and suppressing violence by depriving Palestinians of their basic human rights. This is the policy now being followed. Although many citizens of Israel deride the racist connotation of prescribing permanent second-class status for the Palestinians, as one prominent Israeli said, I am afraid that we are moving toward a government like that of South Africa, with a dual society of Jewish rulers and Arab subjects with few rights of citizenship. The West Bank is not worth it. An unacceptable modification of this choice now being proposed is the taking of substantial portions of the occupied territory, with the remaining Palestinians completely surrounded by walls, fences, and Israeli checkpoints living as prisoners within the small portion of land theft to them. 2006, right? Almost two decades ago. And if you look at a map and you see the expanding land theft, Right. This is a U.S. president speaking. Right. This is not some radical leftist, although he's been cast aside by, uh, you know, by, by presidents that followed as such. But this is a U.S. president. Right. A diplomat in the full sense of the word talking about what he saw with, with his tour. Right. Back then. And then you talk about these last few years and what has taken place. You want to know why you're not seeing the Palestinian narrative? Because the Israeli government could shoot dead a Palestinian American journalist, could bomb the AP building, the Associated Press building, could bomb it to smithereens and not have to pay the price at all, still be shielded from accountability by the American government. The Associated Press is out there still spewing Israeli propaganda, even after, after they flattened their building. So, what chance do the indigenous people of Palestine, and we should use those words too because they're weaponized against us, what chance do the indigenous people of Palestine have without any of the tools of media to share their narrative when they have the entire weight of Western propaganda working against them? And they still have to fabricate news against us. Yeah, They still have to fabricate. This is somehow the irony of it all. You've done all of this and you still have to fabricate. And so when you're speaking to your colleagues, when you're speaking to people um, at, at work and, you know, and, and look, it takes a bit of tolerance from us. I mean, this is uh, this is one of the hard things that also comes with being from the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, look, we spare no dua uh, when it comes to making dua against the oppressors. This is our sunnah, alhamdulillah, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us exactly how to pray against an oppressor. But when someone's ignorant, you got to have a little bit more hidden for that person, a little bit more for, forbearance for that person's ignorance, and try to walk them out of that ignorance. And sometimes I think, and, and I speak for myself, by the way, that, that I found myself in conversations where I'm going off on a person, I have to kind of pull back and say, you know what? You just don't know any better. Let me, let's, let's walk this back. If you were in this position, someone walked into your home and threw you out of it, then relegated you to a tiny piece of land, took away your citizenship status, restricted every part of your movement, choked you off from the rest of the world. What do you do? And people forget. And I, and I want to mention this because we need to educate our audience. Read, right? Read. But people forget. The people of Gaza in particular tried to protest in a nonviolent way. They marched for an entire year on the apartheid wall in the Great Return March. And what happened? Read about Razan Najjar, rahimahullah. May Allah accept her as a shahida, a young uh, Palestinian medic that was out there trying to nurse the wounds of people that were being hit by Israeli snipers. What happened to Ibrahim Abu Thurayya? One of the most inspiring people, subhanAllah, when I think of a man from Ahl al-Jannah, I think of Ibrahim Abu Thurayya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept him as such. Imagine this guy was bombed in the previous bombing of 2014, lost all of his limbs, and was showing up to the Great March in his wheelchair, holding with whatever was left of his limbs, 
a Palestinian flag, and he was killed by an Israeli sniper. What threat did he pose? He was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. Rachel Corey, the irony of the American public is that when American non-Muslims Muslims of conscience have gone over there and have been killed. Shirin Abu Akla was not a Muslim, right? She's a Palestinian-American journalist, fine. Rachel Corey, <laughs> what did she do? What was her crime? What was her crime? This isn't the young Fadis Uda uh, standing in front of a tank holding the rock, that iconic image of Palestinians. This was a white American woman. I believe she was 22 years old or 23 years old young white American woman that went over there as a peace activist and was run over by an Israeli bulldozer on purpose. F full evidence there. This wasn't an AI generated image like the one that Ben Shapiro puts up, right? This was a real image. And what did we do? Absolutely nothing. You know, so when you talk about the Palestinian people and what they have endured. No people in the world would endure what the Palestinian people have endured and simply, you know, uh, say that, you know, we just need to wrap this up and, and just move on with our lives. That's a lot of powerful commentary. I want to pull out just and distill just three things from from what you said because I think they they bear reiterating and and for the audience um, keeping them in mind, especially if you're young, if you're on in these conversations, if you're on a college campus. Um, the one thing is to bring people back to accountability, right? What you said about you know the AP Press building, uh, you know the amount of aid, military aid that Israel gets every single day, and there's it's literally a blank check absolutely no accountability. They can do anything. There is nothing they can't do that will get that check to be even lessened, let alone scrapped, right? Now, just from any rational person, you can think what you want about this side, that side, or whatever. Whatever your allegiance is, tell me that that's a rational position to take. Tell me how long a nation can adopt that as a policy, that they have uh, an ally somewhere that can do absolutely anything they want with no strings attached, no accountability, no responsibility to act in any certain way. The second thing that you said um, is, uh, it's like two and three, for people on the left, there's a, a, a cynical irony at play that the values that the left bases, it takes pride in are being violated again and again and again right in front of your face. You want to stand in front of a classroom and give a land acknowledgement. The land's being snapped, snagged right now. The land is being grabbed right now. The land grab did not end. We can have a conversation about how the land grab is not even over in the West, but it's certainly it's ongoing right now. You want to you you have white guilt, for example, however many years removed. There's something happening, the exact same thing's happening right now in Palestine. So where are your morals? Right? You want to pride yourself on the civil rights movement and the ending of segregation. That's happening right now in Palestine. So for those, those are things that I think are really powerful to, for people to emphasize, that when they're talking to other people, just be consistent for the love of God. Right? Just like if you claim to stand for something, either just admit that you're, okay, I should, I should not use uh, insulting language, but be consistent. Show that you have a spine right? and, and try to think for yourself. Um, the last part, I think, is an interesting segue, the last thing that you said, um, because it brings us to another issue. There's a lot of um, dead ends that are sort of proposed to us when it comes to either, quote unquote, ways out of the, quote unquote, conflict or different sort of um, rhetoric that's deployed to take the conversation, to deflect, to take the conversation away from these sorts of things, um, such as the idea of normalization, such as the idea of, um, or a, a two-state solution, or this solution, or that solution. You know, um, how, do we, how do we respond to those sorts of things? What are, what are some thoughts that we have about that? Dr. Raymond Tuttle. I wanted to mention something slightly different. So if you want to take that one. Sure, um, sure. Back to that one. I think you know one one of the the most significant points, uh, Imam Tom, like in this in this discussion to me, is uh, in all of these discussions, the Palestinian voice itself, the Palestinians themselves are sidelined. So you have the Abraham Accords, which were shameful and 
uh, those that are in a position. I mean, I wrote an article why I oppose the Abraham Accords, um, you know, about a year ago. Uh, and, and I still oppose the Abraham Accords. I think they're as atrocious as they've ever been. And I had like well-meaning people that reached out and said, you know, why shouldn't, shouldn't you be for this? Like, isn't this good that people come together? Uh, you know, isn't this good that we, uh, that, that, that finally, you know, we, we end the hostilities and, uh, I said, no, you know, I'm pretty sure Ibrahim Islam, Abraham wasn't for arms deals and apartheid, which is all this is right. And so it's an apartheid state gets a pass on its apartheid for, uh, military contracts and other sweet benefits to neighboring Arab countries. Like when was Israel at war with this country and that country and that country in the first place, right? Y'all have never been at war, right? Who gets to make peace on behalf of the Palestinians? So the Palestinians get moved to the side. And now what are you seeing in, in the media, in the headlines? Israel, Hamas, Israel, Hamas, Israel, Hamas. Where in the world are the Palestinians? The 7 million people. <laughs> do, do they not get, get any type of voice for themselves, right? So whether you're talking about peace or war, the Palestinians are omitted themselves. And this is uh, a deep hypocrisy, once again, exposing a double standard uh, in the discourse. And I think that Palestinian society has called for the BDS movement uh, for boycotting, divesting, sanctioning. Uh, that has global implications, that has domestic implications. It is a principled stance. It is one that Again, the, the thrust of the political establishment, and Allah knows best, all these new surveillance bills and other types of legislation they're trying to put out in these, in, you know, in, in Russia in these few days that resembles the Patriot Act nonsense that came out after 9-11. And then what becomes, you know, uh, an entire apparatus under, uh, in the name of countering violent extremism, Allah knows best. But you already have anti-BDS laws on so many uh, states' books. Um, when Muslims boycott and when people of conscience boycott, um, brands um, divest from companies that deal in apartheid, that deal in occupation. We send a powerful message. And that takes a level of sacrifice on a personal level. That takes a level of sacrifice on a community level. And we should not apologize for that. And this, the South African uh, freedom fighters that fought apartheid there uh, are the same ones that called what Israel has done to the Palestinians from Mandela to Tutu onwards apartheid. And this is this is a a concrete strategy that we can implement on a personal level uh, as as a community, right? And as as people of consciousness that that want to uh, demonstrate a, a viable way to uh, you know to be in solidarity with Palestinian society. Now, with that being said, look, you have your du'a. We're a people of du'a. We believe in our du'a. We believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We never despair in our du'a. So first and foremost, at the top of at the top of all of this, when people talk about all right, what's a course of action? Well, of course, du'a. No, no, like first and foremost, a du'a, like exert yourself in du'a. Like, have you really exerted yourself in du'a? Make du'a for your brothers and sisters. Not a single du'a is going to go unheard, but in the Nahi Ta'ala. And there is no such thing as a pointless supplication. So exert yourself in du'a. Donate to these uh to these causes. You know, people have been asking about who's on the ground. Um, I know Beitul Mal uh, has has some positioning there, Islamic relief due to their prior infrastructure, especially in the West Bank. They have some ways, inshallah, ta'ala. there's pious projects out of Chicago. You know, do your homework. Uh, some some people here are probably not even in the United States and support uh, these organizations, inshallah, ta'ala, if it seems to check out with the right intention, bin the night ta'ala. Raise your voice um, in whatever way that you can. If you lose something as a result of raising your voice for the Palestinians for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that will be a means of your elevation in this life and the next, inshallah ta'ala. It's worth the sacrifice. Make the sacrifice. We need to do it more than ever now. And let's let's move away from this normalization nonsense, right? This has been to the great detriment of the Palestinian people. It has been a disservice. It has been a betrayal of the Palestinian people and a betrayal of their cause. You know, there's one thing, subhanAllah, that could always unite the hearts of the believers around the world, and it was Palestine and Aqsa. And there's been a syst systematic attempt to remove that, that consciousness from the ummah. And alhamdulillah, it hasn't worked. Alhamdulillah, we're seeing right now, it does not work. There is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in the heart of every believer. This is a matter of aqidah. 
<laughs> this is Quran. This is Aqidah. You're not going to remove Al-Aqsa from the hearts of anyone that believes in that. Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. So we should reject normalization efforts. We should reject all attempts that 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 try to, and, and this was part of the reason why Dr. Uwema and I wrote this paper. They try to Hudaybiya everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, wait, 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 calm, calm down. You know, the people themselves are not at the table. So how can they <laughs> how can they consent to this? So listen to the people themselves. We uplift the people themselves. And by the way, this isn't just true for the Palestinians, and I'll, I'll kind of end on this. This is true for the Syrians. This is true for the Uyghurs. This is true for the people of Kashmir. This is true for the people of India, and so on and so forth, right? We, we follow their lead when they are the oppressed people. And we see how we can help them, inshallah ta'ala, to alleviate their oppression. And bidnillahi ta'ala, we, we stay the course. Look, this is going to be a long this is going to be this is we're, we're 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 in this for the long haul. This is, you know, there are people who have lived through this trauma now for seven decades. My father, right? Like I said, this started when he was five, you know, subhanAllah. So his whole life, he's known occupation, he's known uh displacement, he's known uh th that rhetoric and and uh, destructive discourse his entire life. Uh, we need a little bit more steadfastness, inshallah ta'ala. We're, we need to be steadfast with this cause. We need to nurture the love of Palestine and the love of Al-Aqsa in our kids' hearts. Because you know what? There are a lot of people that see Al-Aqsa as a burden. There are a lot of people that see the Palestinian cause as a burden. You know, it's going to stunt certain mobility in, 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 in politics, certain mobility in, in my career. And so Palestine becomes a burden. So be it. You, you, you need to take this on because they are a people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted you with in this moment right now. Their cause is your cause, inshallah ta'ala. Do not forsake them. Do not turn your back on them. And we need to make sure that the next generation takes them as well. Yeah, we're not we're not going anywhere and we're not quitting. Definitely. Exactly, yeah. Dr. Awaymer, are you, you were patient. Some final thoughts for you, from you. Yeah, no, jazakallah khair. I, I was hearing every word and and and... And enjoying and celebrating because it's, it's exactly what I would have said. Uh, but I want to say, inshallah, all the same things, but in a different register. I want to talk to Muslims. I think it's really, really important that, that we talk to non Muslim friends, and um, many, many good people will immediately see the, the justice. In fact, I see Palestine as like really a heart, moral heartbeat for the world because. It's so clear what's right and what's wrong. And it's so easy for people around the world. I mean, if you some of the best support that you get, some of the most enthusiastic are from the people who have, um, you know, who are Latin Americans or, 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 you know, an African activist. And around the world, people see this and their heart breaks, right? That's why uh, people who are part of the quote unquote third world, people who have been colonized. So you see and you, you say, wow, there is goodness. There is goodness in human fitra. Human beings, humanity can be redeemed because these people actually, despite the propaganda, despite the fact they don't get anything out of supporting Palestine and they will get everything out of supporting this uh, apartheid state, but they stand up, right? These are Christians. These are non-religious people. These are people, but they have a heart, and and so that's uh, you know I I I uh, I think that's a that's a beautiful thing that reminds me of a teaching in my deen, in my religion, which is fitra that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given an inclination for good that is you cannot take it away, and in the conditions when you have lies in media, media and fabrication and double speak and Orwellian world where people cannot do that, right? Um, you, you have to break those idols. And I think that's possible. That's possible in America, that's possible in, in many countries in the world. But I want to uh, speak in the other register, the register of Muslims. How I want to talk to Muslims, I want to talk to our young generation. It's really important. And that was a key point I wanted to make in that article with Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Amr, that Palestine is an Islamic issue. 
It does not mean that it's not about justice, but it is equally and deeply, it's an issue of our aqidah, and it is not a nationalist issue, right? We don't, we don't make those claims merely on the basis of some kind of territorial system that, you know, you cannot steal people's land. We say that because it is, it is a sign of the truth of Islam, truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you find those prophecies coming true. And I say to our young generation and to the imams today and the leaders and preachers, and, and influencers through the heart, educate yourself and teach this stuff. Because you will learn the Quran, you will learn the Sunnah, you'll learn the truth about the world. Um, that's number one. Also, speaking of Abraham Accords and normalization, you know, subhanAllah, I was thinking the other day, the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says that there will be a ta'ifa mansura, an aided group, blessed group, and la, you know, a phrase, and it says, "La yadurruhum man khada lahum wa man khalafahum." It's really interesting, you know, if you see the phrase in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that they will not be harmed by those. It doesn't talk about the enemy first; those who are doing the killing and oppression and opposition, but those who are betraying them are mentioned first. Man khada lahum, those who will betray them will not harm them. It is as if Allah, Rasulullah in his words, inspired words, is taking into account Abraham, of course, and normalization. And people who are saying, right, uh, who do not mention Philistine, and there is only one country in the world, as you know, in the Muslim world, that has not come out mentioning Philistine. As far as I know, there is only one country that calls itself Muslim that has not done that and in fact joined the opposite side and this is one of the most beautiful things about this heartbreaking incidents that are taking place that despite the fact that many muslim rulers want to jump over and normalize they knew that there are certain limits they could not cross with their populations no matter how oppressed they are people are they're not going to let them cross that line only one country has crossed that line and still supported, and does, had not uh, Israel, and has not mentioned Palestine. So, to me, this is like Subhanallah. It is, it is a sign. It's a you know, it's a miracle. It's an ayah I mean, ayatillah azza wa that the words of the Prophet Sallallahu resonate in our daily life uh, so well. I want to say that talking about Palestine is part of our deen. It's something you get ajr for. It's not wasted. It's not wasted time, as the normalizers or their supporters might say. It is talk. Of, it is to talk about the Quran. It is to talk about the Sunnah. It is to talk about our history. It's talking about the Ummah. It's talking about. It's to be what Rasulullah said that the Muslims, the believers, are one body. When one part hurts, the entire body responds by staying up at night and responding with fever. So if you have a Palestine fever, if you have a Palestine fever or a Kashmir fever or Uyghur fever, then glad tidings to you that you are a believer. And if you are saying, sitting in your chair and saying, Palestine is not our burden, you got to check yourself. Because somehow you don't figure in the equation. As, uh, as the hadith at with Rasulullah whoever doesn't care about the affairs of Muslims is not one of them. It's the truth, even though its attribution to the Prophet Sallallahu is considered weak. So, talk about Palestine. And to reiterate what, we, uh, what Sheikh Hamar said, to make dua. But remember, dua is an action plan for a believer. Dua is an action plan for a believer. When you get up in the morning and make dua, oh Allah, give me piety, give me righteousness, right? Save me from deceiving others, save me from being deceived. It's also an action plan. I'm going to do something about it. So when you make dua, first of all, you, you have to make dua, and we do not make enough dua. I do not make enough dua, despite the fact that I do, alhamdulillah. 
I did not make enough dua. We have to, but it also has to be an action plan. So we have to talk about Philistine. You have to talk about Philistine from the perspective that we are talking about, which is you have to know, you know, the oppression. You have to know the the regulations, the the international law, right? The international law that's being violated, we have to tell our children. But we also have to tell them about the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is being violated. And we have to tell them about the promises of Allah that are being kept. And we have to talk about the ayat that mention these struggles. And I will end with this um, uh, incident between Musa alayhi salam and Pharaoh that has always been with me as, uh, as so current. So Musa alayhi salam, um, as, as we all know, the Quran speaks of how uh, he is from uh, Banu Israel, who were the believers and the Muslims of the time. They uh, are being oppressed in Egypt. Uh, Musa alayhi salam is from among them, but raised in Pharaoh's palace. He grows up, accidentally kills an Egyptian, runs away. When he comes back, he is given, uh, uh, given profit food. He now goes to Pharaoh. So this is the scene in Surah Al-Shu'ara, right? Surah Al-Shu'ara, the scene is that he comes to Fir'aun and he makes da'wah. And the Fir'aun says to him, almost exactly like it is as if you're hearing Israeli uh, defense minister or Anthony Blinken, right? President, same thing, yeah, was that same? Yeah, same thing. Uh, President Biden, I didn't mention because I, won't, I don't think he can say so many, that many words. Um, so what does Fir'aun says, say to him? Did we not raise you among us as children? So favor upon you, right? So Fir'aun, propaganda, right? A master of propaganda. He says, look, Musa, Moses, I raised you. And then you did this crime that you know about. And you were ungrateful. So this is Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh. This is the Quran. So now Musa السلام, responds and says, Yes, I did that and I was among those who went astray. I made a mistake. And then Musa alayhi salam says, minkum, I ran away. Hukman, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this wisdom, this knowledge from Allah. And then, and then Musa does what I believe is like just the most powerful, most amazing thing. He says, And the blessing that you're talking about? Your greatness, what you what you did for me, you raised me in my in your palace. Here is here is all something. All something I'll tell you what you did. You have enslaved my people. You have enslaved Bani Israel, the believers, the Muslims of the time. So Musa alayhi salam is identifies himself as the Muslims, the believers, all of them, not himself who was raised in the palace, he identifies with his people. That's what you've done. You have colonized my people. You have enslaved my people. You have terrorized my people. You have divided and humiliated my people. And now you're telling me you raised me. So it is as if this, this little favor, right? Musa alayhi salam is the exact opposite of Abraham, of course. He's saying, you're not going to bribe me because I am with my people. I'm my ummah, I'm ummatic. And so this is a, a brilliant example of deconstruction in the Quran. That's decoloniality. That's Quranic decoloniality that I want to teach our, our, our next generation. I think that's... Uh, Tom, can I, can I just 20 seconds? Yeah. Yeah, of course. When they say these slogans, subhanAllah, no justice, no peace, Allah Azza wa says, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah commands justice and kindness, excellence. And Ibn Abbas says, You can't have ihsan if you don't have adil. Yeah. 
So subhanAllah, again, we have a consistency, a coherence here, which Dr. Oweimer is talking about. We are a people who want peace, but just like any common sense would say to anybody else, even from their fitrah, you can't have peace without justice. And so uh, we pray for justice uh, for, the, for the people of Palestine mm -hmm. and for uh, peace uh, to come after that justice with the Nahi Ta'ala. I mean, I mean, thank you both so much for uh, participating in this conversation. Uh, SubhanAllah, very emotional day. Um, uh, we, we all have a lot of du'a to make. Uh, so thank you both. Subhanakallahumhamdika uh, shirawan la ilaha anta astaghfiraka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam.